Okay, now more detailed points in order uh, from the King reading. So one of the first things King says is he says, uh, I'm actually not from Alabama, so there's people here who say, why are you down here causing a ruckus? Um, these laws don't affect you, right? They don't affect you unless you come to Alabama, so why are you even here? And what he says on page two is he says, I'm here in Birmingham where I don't live because injustice is here. Right? Just as the Christian prophets left their villages to carry their word from town to town, um, he too is compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond his own hometown. He has to constantly respond to the call for aid, he says. And on page 12, we see a similar point um, where he quotes Martin Luther, his namesake, who said, Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God, I must. So this is what he says going back to page 2. He says, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We as human beings are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. We live in the same mutually shared world together. We are tied in a single garment of destiny. So this is how I'd follow up what King says there. The, the general point, one which we'll hijack for our class in general, is that if something is wrong, something has to be done about it. We, we can't just shrug our shoulders and ignore it. Right? So some specific ways I would put this to sort of put the, um, the pressure on you is if you're Christian, as was Martin Luther King Jr., I mean, he, he was a pastor, right? If you're Christian, as was he, then Christianity tells you that each and every person is your kinfolk. You're all brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a Christian uh, uh, tenet, right? A Christian belief. But maybe you're not Christian, or maybe you don't understand your Christianity that way. Okay, if you believe in human rights, such as the right to free speech and the right to property, then you also believe that everyone deserves the defense of those rights. So blacks are not allowed to spend money in certain places because of um, segregation, if they're not allowed to move their physical bodies certain places, or if they're um, more likely to be shot and killed, for instance, so their right to life when they're innocent, then those are human rights. And if you believe in your own human right to free speech and the right to property and the right to bodily integrity, those are not your individual rights but rather they're human rights. So you should be worked up when someone else's human rights are being violated because it's your right as well that's being violated. And another way to sort of put the pressure on all of us um, is that if you're an American, freedom doesn't mean individual freedom alone, but it means freedom for all of us. This is sort of related to the human rights point, but I want to make it specific about Americans. Right. Um, what America says is that it's uh, it's not every person for themselves, right? But that it's all of us being the most free country in the world, as a sort of light on a hill, as it's been said, an inspiration to all of humanity, that a whole community could live freely rather than just a few individuals. Right. That's the promise of America, and if you care about that, um. It's not enough to just absorb the freedom that you can, but you have to maintain the freedom and the promise of freedom for all of America. So King says, I'm here because whether it's injustice in my backyard or injustice around the world, something has to be said and done about it. So page three, um, the way that King and, and others around him related to him protested uh, civil rights violations is they would do things like sit at a lunch counter that said no Negroes and sorry for saying that word but that's how the signs would have been uh, said back then right um, uh, sitting there and then forcing the people to deal with them being there and then sometimes the cops would get called it as well they would march in places where they were not given a permit to march so they'd be violating the law so nonviolent protest, the way that King and others practiced it, means that you deliberately violate a law. You don't just write a letter to the governor saying racism is bad, segregation is bad. You violate the law. 
Now you can see, especially back in the day when King didn't have a lot of support from people, they'd say, whoa, 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 whoa. You're saying that a law is bad and it should be, a, there should be other laws that should be respected. So then you come and you violate the law. So you're just going to pick and choose which laws you like and violate the ones you don't like. That's not how, that's not how law works, right? So here are a few things that he says. First is that you only violate unjust laws. Second, you use non-violence. So you don't burn down the place that's segregated. You just go there calmly, peacefully. You never raise a fist. And you resist the law non-violently. Okay? So again, first point is that you, um, you only resist or break unjust laws. You, you don't br break the speed limit in order to draw attention to civil rights right? You break the civil rights laws that are unjust. Second is always you must, must, must be nonviolent. Okay? Third point is this. You must accept the punishment for the unjust law. So that's civil disobedience in King's sense. The three important parts are that you violate only unjust laws. You don't stop paying your taxes because you don't like segregation laws. Second is always, always, always nonviolent. Third, and this is the, a weird twist for some people, is you accept the punishment for the unjust law being broken. That's why King was in jail. It's not like he went on the run and the cops tracked him down. He broke the law and said, I am here breaking this law because it's unjust. I do so peacefully, so I'm not a threat. You don't need to worry about me. And I calmly accept my punishment. So, a question I want to ask you all is, why do you think those three things are so important? Okay? As always with these questions, you don't have to analyze all three. Analyze the ones you think are most interesting. Why does it have to be nonviolent? Why does it have to be the law itself that you want to challenge, which you break? Okay. And why do you have to accept the punishment? Wouldn't it have been better, frankly, if King didn't have to go to jail? So that's another question I'm asking. is um, Why are these three pillars so important for nonviolence? Why are they such a good way, basically, to resist unjust laws? Okay. So one of the things that King says... Uh, I think this has relevance for today. It also has relevance for the general point of our class. Is on page three, he says, his work is going to create a tension in the mind of society. It's going to force us to confront issues and that his nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and tension that the community has to negotiate uh, and can no longer ignore the issue. So, um, whether we're talking about racism or other issues today, I think if we don't talk about them, uh, they only get worse, as we'll speak about in a moment. Um, and that if you talk about them, you'll never really make an issue worse by talking about it. You'll probably help find a way to make it better or solve it, but really just speaking about an issue in society probably isn't going to make that issue worse. Right? Right? The issue didn't come about because people are talking about it. So let's put it this way. It wasn't the discussion of race and racism that made early Americans enslave a people, right? Something else was at work there. So if it was caused by something other than talking about the issue, you know what I mean? It's, it's probably not talking about differences between, say, the Democrats and the Republicans that make us more polarized. It's probably not talking about race and racism that makes us racist, so he says you have to bring that tension to light. Is there anything for our class? We're going to talk about abortion, you know, all sorts of controversial issues. I think talking about the controversy controversy doesn't make the, the uh, disagreements worse. And of course, I think it makes them better. 
So we'll connect this point about why, why saying nothing and doing nothing makes the problem worse, doesn't make it better, by jumping to pages 7, this definitely goes to 8, 9, uh, definitely pages 7 through 9, and it comes up again, uh, page 11, it's, it's a major, major theme for King. So this is what he says at page 7 going over to page 8. He says, he's gravely disappointed with the white moderate. Okay. Um, he says, there's definitely, there's definitely people in the 60s who were white southerners, right? Um, who said, man, this segregation is messed up, but we don't like the way that King is going about it. So we also think segregation is bad and that it should stop. But he's causing too much tension. He's causing too much disagreement and discord to erupt into public. Right? So this is what he says. He says, hey, we didn't cause the tension, right? We didn't cause the tension by breaking segregation laws. We didn't cause the tension by talking about racism and making it show up on the TV. We only brought to the surface a tension that was already there, already alive. It was just hidden. So he says, like a boil or a wound that can never be cured so long as it's covered up, but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure is going to create to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion. Only then can it be cured. So what he says is the people who occasionally in polite company mumble under their breath, man, I've really think segregation, racism, whatever it may be, is a bad thing. They're actually helping the problem perpetuate itself. Page 90 calls it an appalling silence. So here's a metaphor I like to use to explain uh, Martin Luther King here. And it fits well with St. Augustine and um, a certain way of thinking about uh, history and progress and what it means to be a good person. Remember what I said before that uh, for King, if you do nothing, you're not actually doing nothing. If there's something bad going on, if there's some injustice going on and you do nothing, he says you're not actually a moderate, neutral, do-nothing person. You're actually giving implicit comfort and aid to those doing injustice. Those who do injustice are emboldened to do more injustice if you don't resist them. So that's the sort of psychological aspect of it. It's like when people talk about appeasement of dictators, right? If you don't tell Hitler to stop, psychologically he's going to get bolder and he's going to take, after Poland, he's going to take, you know, uh, Finland, etc. as well. But here's a more sort of... Uh, Here's a different point. If something is bad in the world and you don't resist it, presumably the bad thing will keep operating. Right? Like if there's a weed in your front yard and you don't do anything about it, is the weed going to be there tomorrow? I mean, yeah, all other things being equal. So doing nothing, the result of doing nothing when there's something bad is that the bad thing gets to live another day. So then, ignoring the psychological component, right, that your silence is taken as implicit consent, implicit support by those doing evil. The more general point is that if you actually don't act against something bad, it's just going to show up again the next day. So you're allowing something bad to flourish through doing nothing means you're not doing nothing, but you're supporting and perpetuating some bad injustice. That's why silence on an issue is appalling to him. Silence about an injustice is not silence, but it's basically whispered support for the injustice. So the image I like to do here, and it relates to St. Augustine, uh, like I said, and other philosophers, is that you're, uh, it takes effort to even maintain yourself. It takes effort to stay in the same place. So think about gravity. If you're standing on a flat surface, whether you realize it or not, it takes calories and muscle work and everything just to maintain your upright posture. 
if you didn't actually flex certain of your muscles basically throughout the day, your posture would crumple over and literally you just fall to the ground if you actually relaxed all your muscles and did nothing at once. You'd flop down to the ground. You'd be like a snake on the ground, right? Just lying there. Okay. So it takes effort to even just maintain yourself. So think about it. If you want to improve yourself or improve the world, just standing there, you can't do nothing. Because you already have to do something just to stay the same. If you want to get bigger and stronger or help others, you're going to have to do more than nothing. So as he says... Um, Page 9, page 9, he says, Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. Progress has to come about through the tireless efforts, extra effort, of people willing to be co-workers with God. Without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally, a helper of the forces of social stagnation. So, okay, I just talked about being on a flat surface. The metaphor of King and Augustine actually works more like this. You're never on a flat surface. You're always on a steep incline. So if you even just want to stay put where you are on the incline, it takes a lot of fighting and effort just to stay put. If you're on a steep hill or incline, if you do nothing, you're not even just going to flop on the ground like I said before. You're going to fall down and start rolling downhill. If the world actually did nothing, the destiny of the world would be decline things would get worse. So if you try to maintain the status quo by doing nothing, it's actually just going to get worse every day. So it takes some effort even just to keep things as decent as they are. But if you want them to get better and you do nothing, you're actually rolling downhill and dragging others with you. You're certainly not just going to magically like leapfrog up the hill. By doing nothing. That's not how time and progress work. So that's part of why I said, you know, that fits into what I said earlier about let's not be so quick. Let's be a little more careful to just say, oh, inevitably human progress marches on. Like technology, morality, and politics just slowly get better over time. It's inevitable. He says there are no wheels of inevitable inevitability. And that's why he says page four. He says, for years now, he's heard the word wait. People saying, okay, racism is still present, segregation is bad, but wait, don't, don't rush it, your time will come. And he says, really? In his experience, wait has almost always meant never. If you do nothing, you don't make progress. He says, you must come to see um, that justice too long delayed is justice denied. So that's why we see on page 12, like I said, he, he, he builds up and moves through these. He makes one point, then builds on that to the next point, builds on that to the next point. This is why he says, people are telling him that he's an extremist. He's breaking laws. He's getting a bunch of people from out of state to come in and protest. Basically, he's talking too much and doing the wrong things. He's an extremist. Right? And he goes, no, 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 I'm... I, well, he says, yeah, I am an extremist. This is page 12. He says, I am an extremist. But there is, in fact, no neutral position. Because remember, if being neutral and doing nothing means you actually go downhill, and if not voicing um, your disagreement with a tyrant or with those who do injustice gives them implicit comfort and support, then neutrality is not actually neutral. Neutrality is an extremity itself. It's on the wrong side of history, though. The do-nothing people are extremists for hate, he says, ironically. Because they don't fight hate, they end up supporting it. So he says, I didn't used to think I was an extremist. Now I agree. But he says everyone's an extremist, whether they realize it or not. You're either in the clan, basically. You're an extremist for hate. Or you're an extremist for love, like, like King. And he says, those who think they're in the middle, sitting on the fence, being lukewarm, 
not wanting to commit and do and say things out loud. He says they're helping the clan, they're helping the unjust law, etc. So they're extremists for hate, even though it doesn't look like it at first glance. So basically he says, put on your battle gear. Everyone has to choose a side because everyone is in fact supporting one side or the other. Even the so-called moderate or neutral or lukewarm person. So name your side and actually fight out loud for it or else you'll be standing with the KKK. I mean to be uh, maybe a little overly dramatic about it. So 14, King goes on to say, and I think we can take this as a general inspiration for our life in general. Okay, so again, we want to retain the elements about race and about American history, but we also want to, we can double the use of King because he's, he's so good that way. So take this as a general attitude towards your life. He says, do you want to be a thermometer or a thermostat? Okay, a thermometer registers what the temperature actually is. Okay, it just reports or registers what the temperature actually is. A thermostat, though, is that thing on your wall where you push the buttons or twist the dial to make the temperature change. It says, what do you want to be? Do you want to be a reflection of the society around you? Do you want to conform to the status quo? Do you want to be whatever other people are being? Or would you rather be an active partner in some sort of struggle for freedom in this case? He says you don't want to be a thermometer. That's no way to live your life. Simply looking like the other things around you. You want to be a thermostat where you change the temperature. Where you improve the social mores and the social beliefs. So I think those are words to live by, right? Even if you think King was important 50 or so years ago, but now we're past all that, you could still take this as an inspiring quote in general. Don't be a thermometer, be a thermostat. Don't register what is, but improve what is. Change it. Okay. Now certainly that advice would go double if you think that we still have racial troubles that we have to get past. And one final point, this is page 16, is King himself says why um, you have to use nonviolence. He basically says you can't fight fire with fire. What, how he actually says it is he says, the means or techniques that we use must be as pure as the ends or goals which we seek. So we see this language of means and ends again. It's very common. Um, he says the the... The actions we do in service of a goal must be as pure as the good goal that we're seeking. He says, it's clearly wrong to use immoral means to attain moral ends. It is wrong, he says, to use immoral methods in order to attain a good moral goal. Right? Um, and that's important. I bet we can think of possible counterexamples where we might disagree and say, mm, maybe some goals are so important that you have to do something immoral in order to achieve it. But I'm sure with a lot of analysis too, um, we could probably think of ways where uh, we, we would challenge that assumption. Okay, but that's where King stands. He says, you can't... Uh, you know this expression, like if you want to do politics, you have to get your hands dirty? right? King is going to say, no, 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 no. If, if to solve some political problem, you get your hands dirty, you're just going to be the new boss, same as the old boss, right? You'll end up just being as bad as the problem you seek to displace. Right? So that's a pretty high bar. King does not make it easy on those of us who want to press for social justice. Shoot, he doesn't make it easy on those who don't want to press for him, right? Because he says, no, no, the do-nothings are extremists for hate. They, they prop up the dictator, right? So this is one way to think about uh, moral and ethical theorists like Martin Luther King Jr. At one level, it can seem sort of daunting. Like I said, a burden. Wow, so I have to fight every injustice and it, in my state, in other states, presumably across the world? 
right? Before he was assassinated, he got more interested in international politics. And you'd be like, oh, Martin, man, that's exhausting. Right? Like Dr. King, I don't know if, I don't know if that's in me. So one way to think about this is to say, what he's asking sounds nice, but it's impossible, right? It's impossible. I'm going to have to remain moderate and neutral on this one because that's just asking too much. But I think that's the wrong attitude to take towards it. I think you could say half of that and then not the other half. You could say it's impossible. He's right. But think about it this way. That's actually just a challenge, right? What, how do you want to show yourself as a person? Someone who only took on possible, realistic, easy challenges? Like you got all A's in remedial classes. All you took was 101, 101, you know, geology 101, geography 101, philosophy 101. And you got all A's? Or do you want to be the person who tries to get an A in that one class? You know that professor who everyone says like, oh, they do not give any A's at all. Wouldn't you rather try for something like that, something worth winning, even if you didn't exactly execute it perfectly? So that's the way I view it, is that even if King is asking too much for us, even if Dr. King's asking too much of us, he knows that, and he says it's better to strive for the highest goal and maybe not reach it perfectly than to sit here and be a conformist and only, quote, succeed at things that aren't worth achieving. Okay? So, linking up to this, page 15, he says, right defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. Another way we might put this is that doing the minimum or being a conformist, only doing what's required and easy and expected of you, is worse than trying really hard to achieve something great and not quite succeeding. So don't let the difficulty of the task scare you. Let it be like a thrilling challenge, right? The gauntlet has been thrown down. So that is our, uh, the end of our recordings for Martin Luther King Jr. Um, once more, if you have any questions about assignments, about readings, about anything like that, send me an email and we'll, we'll sort that out. Uh, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you, everyone.